I will call to order the October meeting of the Bloomington Board of Park Commissioners. And um, Kim, will you start us with the roll call, please? Yes. Kathleen Mills. Here. Ellen Rodkey. Here. Israel Herrera. Jim oh. Here. Okay. We lost Jim's face, but we know he's there somewhere yes. in the ether. I'm here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jim, I'll get you back up in just a second, okay? All right, that's okay. I can see me. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so we do have a quorum, we have all of our members. And first off, we usually take the consent calendar as one motion. Um, and these are the big part of the, the half of this is just things we see every month, like business reports and non reverting budget amendments, and then some smaller partnership agreements. And I will note that in A8, the partnership agreement with Bloomington Blades High School Hockey Association still needs a signature, but we, I think if we're comfortable going ahead and approving it as we've seen it and then we can get the signature after that so um, so do we have a motion to approve the consent calendar yeah move to approve the consent calendar Second. okay and a roll call vote please Kathleen Mills aye Ellen Rodkey aye Israel Herrera aye. Jim Whitlatch aye okay motion is unanimously carried um, and then next up in our Section B, Public Hearings and Appearances, we have Emily Book to present the Bravo Award. Okay, um, good afternoon. Emily Book, Community Relations Coordinator, and the Bloomington Parks and Recreation Department would like to recognize Ann Barnes with the October Bravo Award. Uh, Ann has become a regular group leader at our Leonard Springs Nature Days program this fall. Leonard Springs Nature Days is one of our more difficult volunteer asks. The program runs throughout the day on Tuesdays and it makes it, can make it difficult to find volunteers who are either usually working or in school. Um, and becoming a regular volunteer has been such a benefit to both us and the kids. She's a very experienced hiker who's been great with the kids, um, even being sure to keep them engaged by playing an iSpy game as the students traverse the stations um, around the park. Uh, Leonard Springs Nature Days is one of our favorite programs to put on for children in our community, and we definitely could not do it without the assistance of our volunteers. Um, people like Anne, who go out of their way to get involved and support us, are very appreciated by everyone involved. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. That's a great picture with a horse, too. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. And then next up, we have a um, staff introduction, natural resources intern, Sophie Gilliland. Hi, I'm Sophie Gilliland, and I am a natural resources intern. Uh, I'm studying earth science at Indiana University, and uh, I'm really excited to be working with the city and starting this internship. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, and um, then in our, we have a couple of staff uh, recognitions. So first up is Robbie Turpin, Operations Division Crew Leader. I, I will Robbie. take this one. We won't, okay. make, we won't make him get up and just start talking. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, have, we have two recognitions tonight. Um, one is of Robbie Turpin and one of Barb Dunbar. Uh, we'll, we'll start with Robbie. Um, Robbie has announced his intention to retire here before the end of the year. Um, Robbie has been with the city, Robbie, 1982, correct? Yeah. Or it was it 81? Uh, seasonal in 81, 81 full-time in 82. Uh, that is 41 incredible years of service to Bloomington. Um, in, in my short time here, I've seen Robbie do so much uh, for playgrounds and park maintenance and, and working with the crew that just gets out there and just takes care of whatever improvements need to be done. And I know Certainly a lot of how we do that stuff uh, has, has changed over the last 41 years. Robbie, do you want to say anything? You're good? <laughs> I thought that might be the answer. 
Um, I, we have something for both of you here, but um, maybe we can go to the next one. <clears throat> so Barb Dunbar, got some great pictures here. <laughs> 39 years of service uh, to the Parks Department. Um, <clears throat> Over, over 80 years of service combined right here. And of course, Paula, last month, we are truly losing a lot of really wonderful people who have served the city for, for so long uh, in a variety of ways. And um, just speaking on my own perspective since I've arrived and, and see what Barb does is, is Barb is truly uh, the glue of the operations department, um, keeps us all honest, keeps track of all the different things going on in so many different ways, so many different spreadsheets, so many different... Uh, hands and all the different projects and things that we do. Um, so we know with uh, these two retirements, we just want to recognize the tremendous amount of service. I'll, I'll call you up to, to get your items here in a second. Um, but, but Robbie for 41 years, Barb for 39 years. Gosh, we are really going to miss you. Uh, thank you so much. And we look forward to, to celebrating your final weeks with us here at the city. Barb, do you want to say anything? my attire. I worked out at Leonard Springs all day today with the kids at the uh, Nature Days, which is so fun. That's been always fun doing that every year. Yeah, so I started in 84. We were Bloomington Monroe County Parks and Recreation Department. Frank Reagan was the director. I've been through five directors in my time here. It's been quite a lifetime experience. Um, I have so many wonderful memories. I think what I'm going to miss most is the faces, the staff, and I keep telling them, you'll see me around, I'm sure I'll be doing some volunteering here and there. But for, at first, I'm just gonna take it easy <laughs> and not do much of anything. But I just wanna say thank you to all of you for always being supportive of, and backing us up on the projects and all the contracts I've, I've done, and you've been a wonderful park board. And many, many thanks to the staff, of course, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been amazing. It's, 30, 36 years with the city, but 39 years with the department. So thank you very much. Barb and Robbie, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both for your incredible service. Do you, Barb, do you still have the Wonder Woman costume? Or? Yeah. Oh. Who, who can admit or get to say they got to be a superhero one day? That's true. That's true. <laughs> All right. Um, and then we will move into our Section C, Other Business. Um, and somehow we are missing Paula McDevitt. Um, so not missing, missing. We're, we're happy to have you here, Tim. Um, so we will have the interim director appointment um, and the resolution for that. Is it, is it? No? Uh-oh. Okay. Hmm. I don't see it in my after. Yeah, no matches. No. Okay. Sorry. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So, um, whereas the Common Council of the City of Bloomington, Indiana has established a Parks and Recreation Department, Bloomington Municipal Code 2.20.000. And on, whereas on October 17, 2023, Mayor John Hamilton appointed Tim Street as interim director of the Parks and Recreation Department of the City of Bloomington, Indiana, and whereas Indiana Code 36-4-9-2A3 states that appointment of the head of the Parks and Recreation Department is subject to the approval of the City's Board of Park Commission, and now therefore be it hereby resolved by the City of Bloomington Board of Park Commissioners, Monroe County, Indiana, that the City of Bloomington Board of Park Commissioners hereby confirms Mayor John Hamilton's appointment of Tim Street 
as interim director of the Parks and Recreation Department of the City of Bloomington, Indiana. This resolution shall be effective upon its adoption. All right. And then we have a motion to approve the resolution. Yeah, because it is read. Yeah. Okay. So I'll move to approve the interim director appointment, resolution 23 03. Second. Okay. And a roll call vote, please. Stephanie Jones. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. Okay. All right. Unanimously approved. Welcome, Tim. <laughs> um, okay. And uh, then. We'll get right to Tim presenting an um, um, MOU with Monroe County for Fullerton Pike Project. Yeah, good evening, Park Commissioners. Uh, Tim Street, Interim Director of the Parks Department. Um, I have two items this evening. The first item is a memorandum of understanding with Monroe County Commissioners uh, for construction and maintenance responsibilities regarding the Fullerton Pike Extension Project. Um, Commissioners, you might recall a couple of years ago in 2021, you approved a section 4F de minimis letter um, about the impacts of this project to the trail. Um, and now as the construction uh, approaches letting and actually happening, I believe next year, uh, it was time to enumerate some responsibilities. Um, so this MOU just uh, clarifies responsibilities for uh, construction. And then once the new bridge over Clear Creek Trail is complete, um, and the new attachments are completed, uh, who will be maintaining the various um, new improvements going forward. Okay. All right, any questions uh, for Tim about this MOU? No questions. No? Uh, I'll move to approve a okay. uh, memorandum of understanding with Monroe County for the, uh, the Board of Park, uh, I'm sorry, they're not Park Commissioners, the Monroe County Board of Commissioners uh, for the Fullerton Pike project. Second. Okay, and a roll call vote. Stephanie Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. Okay, motion is carried. And then Tim will stay with this for to present C2, which is an addendum with ENB paving for 2023 parks infrastructure project. Yes, that's right. Um, so we have before you tonight uh, recommend approval of a contract addendum with E&B Paving uh, to address additional identified scope of work for the 2023 Parks Infrastructure Projects in an amount of $6,900. Uh, and this will be coming from ARPA funds we were able to confirm today. Um, you've probably seen this project happening around town. This infrastructure project has worked on uh, some various repairs in the B-Line at RCA Park, um, has added the center stripe to the B-Line. Uh, the last remaining work to be done as part of this project is uh, resurfacing the second half of Rose Hill Cemetery that was not done last year. Uh, as we looked at that second half, um, we determined that one section of road would need to be just slightly rerouted uh, in order to avoid um, doing some very permanent damage to some oak tree roots uh, on some really nice mature oak trees in Rose Hill Cemetery. So this amount is to cover that change order. Okay. All right. Any questions about this item for Tim? Now I'll move to approve the addendum with EMB paving for uh, 2023 infrastructure work. Second. Okay, and a roll call vote, please. Stephanie Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. Okay, motion is carried. Um, and then next up, Julie Ramey will tell us about uh, policy 10120 advertising in the parks. Good afternoon. I am Julie Ramey, the Community Relations Manager for Parks and Recreation. And before you today, I am bringing a new policy for your review and approval. This policy has always existed in an informal manner, but with the advent of partnership agreements and MOUs with organizations, including the Bloomington Football Club and the Bloomington Pickleball Club, who as a fundraising measure for their own organizations, oftentimes sell advertising for display in parks and fields and courts where their organization does a lot of improvement work for the benefit of the space for everyone. And so I felt it important to formalize the advertising policy that indicates very specifically what types of 
sponsorships and advertising is permitted on parks and recreation property. It's sort of understood, but now formalized that, for example, we do not accept advertisements from businesses who garner a majority of their business profits or income from tobacco products, from alcoholic beverages, from vaping products, or ammunition or firearms. There's also a, some details in, in the policy about the types of businesses that are considered adult-themed businesses. So upon approval, this policy will be shared with all of our partners who have the opportunity to sell advertising on their own as fundraisers for their own organizations through very detailed and specific partnership agreements with Parks and Recreation. So these are only the groups that have signed partnership agreements with us. And this gives them then the guidelines that they need to sell advertising for their own, their own uh, organizations in parks. Thank you, Julie. So just to be clear then, some, org some groups that we have um, partnerships with would like have, for instance, a banner that says the name of their group, and then they would also have ads on that for local businesses? Is that what you're saying? Or that, is that, that it's already happening in that fashion? I'm just trying to understand if there's something that's already happening with the ads. A good example would be the Bloomington Blades, with whom we have a partnership agreement at Frank Southern Ice Arena. They are attempting to raise funds to replace some outdated storage cabinets at the ice arena. The cabinets are old and somewhat rickety, and they would really like to get some new cabinets to store their hockey gear. And to do this, they are selling space, advertising space, that will go on the storage cabinets um, when, the when they raise enough money to purchase the storage cabinets outright, the cabinet will remain at Frank Southern Ice Arena, but we're simply providing them the space so that they can raise the funds in order to purchase equipment for the benefit of the entire arena. The same is being done by the Bloomington Pickleball Club. They, are, um, they have raised funds to erect a windscreen around the pickleball courts at RCA Park and to help fundraise that, again, the windscreens for the benefit of all pickleball players, they have space available on the windscreens where they are selling banner advertisements. So the money goes to the pickleball club, the pickleball club does all of the, the management, the contracts, the collections, the recruitment, all of those things, and puts up a windscreen banner with the permission of Parks and Recreation and this is just a way that we're trying to make it easier for them to do the things that they want to do to improve the facilities. Okay, thank you. And I, I assume I'll, there's also a formal process for if I want to put up a windscreen or, I mean, we parks would have to approve what it is, what, what you want as a group to add or to change or to update, right? Cabinets or windscreen. I mean, there would be potentially things we would say, no, you can't raise funds for that or? Sure, it's, it's not intended to be a random opportunity for someone to sell space and keep the money for something. There's, this is all uh, based on a formal partnership agreement, a conversation with park staff, an understanding of what types of improvements we would like to make jointly, that we would jointly like to make, and giving the uh, organization that we're working with the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments for Julie? Julie, <clears throat> yeah, thank you for the information. Who, who is going to screen or, or to uh, give the final word for accepting or, or, or allowing this uh, advertising? The way that this is written, the final signature is the parks director. So if there's ever a question about whether or not a certain type of advertising is acceptable, whether a certain signage is acceptable, then the uh, parks director at the time would have the final say. All of the organizations that I just named, I, we have great working relationships with and I have ongoing communication with the folks in those organizations. So we're working very closely on the production of the advertising pieces, so we actually get a chance to review and approve the specific advertising before the, the banner or the signage is even made. Thank you, and one of the, one of the uh, things that also the policy tries to do is uh, the authorization or the removal uh, of the signs without 
further notice. So what would be those scenarios where there is going to be a removal of, uh, of uh, signage or any, any kind of advertising? The way this policy is written, the, it, there's a time frame, there's a time limit. So an, a, an agreement with an, a group that is advertising on parks properties is only for a certain amount of time. So say 12, ca 12 calendar months. If during the course of that time frame, if the advertiser does not pay, if, there's a, if they're in arrears in paying for the space, then the, the signage can be removed, and removed without no, notification. If the banner becomes torn or vandalized or the company goes out of business, there's clauses in the policy that guide the removal of the banners as well. And this applies to any advertising, for example, in, in uh, fields, in, in parks, not just in the facility, but in a park, if there it is- It does not cover, oh, I'm, T no, tell me if, I've, if I have misunderstood your question. It doesn't cover the, the creation of space anywhere except where space already exists. So we're not building new billboards or any kind of structures. We're utilizing what we currently have on site at parks and facilities for the sale of, of, of spaces like this. Yeah, a couple, just, just a couple questions. Um, so all of the money from this advertising goes to the groups, is that correct? None comes to the Parks Department, or does it? The, way, the agreements that we currently have, yes. Yes, it goes to the groups. Sorry, yes, the, the fundraising, for example, the fundraising that the Blades is doing as I speak, is intended to go solely to the purchase of these storage cabinets, with the which the facility manager also acknowledges the need and the desire to have some updated equipment on site. The Blades has indicated the same, and they have volunteered to take on the task of fundraising. And to help them do that, we are offering for the this year only, the 2023-2024 ice season, they get all the spaces that they that they can sell to keep the money to buy these storage cabinets. We will readdress our agreement for the ice season next fall. And I'm not, I glanced at the policy. I haven't read it with great detail, but I assume the, uh, it may say this in there. If it doesn't, I just am wanting to, your thoughts on it or if it's something that needs to be added. I assume any advertising or signage is meant to be temporary and removable. My, the, what I would be concerned about is if we have a windscreen put up at a pickleball court that has uh, sewn into it or something advertising that the only way you can remove it is to have a new windscreen. Um, so I assume that's something we'll want to make sure as part of the policy. Is that fair to say? The Bloomington Pickleball Club anticipated that very issue and purchased the windscreen and sells smaller squares of material to go over in, in addition to the existing windscreen. So yes, there is a time limit on all of the signage that, that we're talking about and that falls under this policy. Thank you. And is it, are we only accepting advertising, are we only approving an advertisement partnership when it's in this instance of raising money for an addition to a facility? Or is this like cover just all advertising in general in parks? Like all of these scenarios that you brought up were things where we have a partnership agreement with an existing organization and they're wanting an addition, you know, a, a extra fixture in a park. So they're raising money to purchase the extra fixture and then advertising the company that they raised, they raised money from on the fixture. Is that the only scenario in which this takes place? Or are we, like, is there, I guess I'm just, like, um, I don't know if there's just signage that um, 
the figure skating club just wants to like advertise their club, join their club or something. Is that regulated through the same? We're just talking about paid ads for, yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm just a little confused. All advertising in parks. So in the instance that you just, just said, the Bloomington Figure Skating Club, they worked directly with us for a dasher board space promoting their club at the Frank Southern Ice Arena that was outside what the Blades are doing for their cabinet. So we charged the Bloomington Figure Skating Club a fee for the dasher board space, looked at the artwork, approved the artwork, printed their dasher board, and installed it for them. So that's part of the advertising sales that we've been doing in Parks and Recreation since we bought the Twin Lakes Recreation Center in 2009 and when we inherited the advertising sales program that was there. So if someone wants, for example, to advertise their business at the Twin Lakes Recreation Center, I would evaluate their, we, we have a price structure, we have a, a fee structure, a sales package, everything for that information, and I would use the exact same policy to evaluate whether or not that business would be permitted to advertise in our facility. So we just didn't have a policy necessarily bef before this existed Correct. for those processes. And so then is there, will we see like these partnerships or these kinds of agreements come through like the consent calendar in the future? Not is necessarily. The advertising policy? agreements that my colleague Emily and I conduct in, on an annual basis with various advertisers at the Twin Lakes Recreation Center, at the Ice Arena, and at Bryan Park Pool are all advertising agreements that we handle internally. So you would not necessarily see or be able to have the opportunity to approve a particular advertising agreement with an individual business. Okay. And is there any separate approval process that you go through to determine like what a group can fund? So like these cabinets, for instance, is there is that uh, fall under a separate policy of like, well, if we didn't someone said, oh, I want to pay for new um, benches on a pickleball court. And we're like, well, that's not really something we want in the parks. Is that, like, how do we vet that separately? Or do we vet that separately? I would say on a case-by-case -case basis. So if a group were to approach us about a park improvement that we didn't necessarily have the budget to fund, then the, the department would be open to a discussion about what kind of amenity they're looking for, how much it costs, what the lifespan is, and then what, what's realistic as far as get using advertising as a funding piece for, for that amenity. Okay, okay, yeah, sorry. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, Going any dance. other questions for Julie? Okay. Do you want to move? Yes, the I'll make a motion to approve the policy one zero one two zero advertising in parks. Second. Okay, and a roll call vote. Kevin Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. Okay, motion Thank is you. carried. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Oh, and one last Barb Dunbar time at the podium. <laughs> Barb Dunbar, Operations Coordinator. Okay, so um, this is simply a, an addendum to an already in place annual service agreement. Staff recommends approval with Purcell Monument for some headstone restoration repairs. Funding for this services is provided by a hand neighborhood improvement grant received by the Prospect Hill Neighborhood Association for headstone repairs, specifically at Rose Hill Cemetery. In April 2023, the PHNA received grant funds in the amount of 12590 and the portion of those, the $6,340, was earmarked for headstone restorations to be performed by Purcell Monument at Rose Hill. So again, I, um, the, the, already, the one that was already in place, our original standard annual service agreement was for $5,000. That has been, already been used um, for more headstone repairs earlier in the year through our general fund. Um, and as part of the city's ongoing efforts for annual repairs. With this additional grant funding is necessary, this, this additional grant funding is necessary to increase the amount on the service agreement to allow for more much needed headstone repairs. So like I said, it's just simply an addendum to the amount on the already existing agreement. Can I answer any questions? 
All right. Any questions about this item? Okay. I do have a question for you after we vote on this that's related, but um, okay. Do you want to? I'll move? move to approve a contract with Purcell Monument for repairs at Rose Hill. Second. Okay. In a roll call vote. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. Okay. Motion is carried. I just wondered, because we many of us saw that news story about the damage in the cemetery from the person fleeing the police, and I assume that's, we're evaluating. I'm in the process of getting quotes to have okay. the wall repaired. It doesn't look like we're going to get money reimbursed from that driver. I, I doubt it very much. That's not been confirmed, but it's not looking good. Okay. Um, but yeah, we do hope to get that get repaired. repaired. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Just curious. Thank you. Okay. Oh, All right. Welcome. Thanks, Barb. Okay, and then it's always tree pruning time. So C5 is a review of contract with Bluestone Tree from Haskell Smith. Good morning, everyone. Haskell Smith, Urban Forester. Um, staff recommends approval of this contract with Bluestone Tree LLC to conduct tree pruning and deadwood removal along South Alcott Boulevard, South Adams Street, and Adams Hill Circle. Uh, the amount not to exceed $42,515. Um, the total number of trees pruned in this project is 111 along uh, important streets through these neighborhoods. Um, these pin oaks is the majority of the trees. They droop and have dead wood and they're constant, uh, in constant need of maintenance, it seems. So I've targeted those for this. Um, winter is the preferred time to prune oak trees to avoid potential fungus cross contaminations. Uh, last winter, Bluestone conducted a very similar pruning jog along East Winston Street. <coughs> Uh, with great quality and great response from the pro adjacent property owners. Okay. All right. Any questions for Haskell about this? No, I've noticed a lot of limbs down in winds recently on neighborhood streets. So. Mm -hmm. I will make a motion to approve approval uh, for a contract with Bluestone Tree LLC to conduct tree pruning. Okay. In a roll call vote. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. Okay. The motion is carried. And then um, Haskell also has an addendum with Bluestone Tree for hazard tree removal. I do. Uh, staff recommends approval of contract addendum with Bluestone Tree to address additional identified hazard trees, uh, amount not to exceed 9,500 for a total of 27.5. Um, they've removed, we've used up uh, all of the amount on my service agreement, but I still have some trees we, I just don't think we're gonna get to this year that I'd like to see removed. Okay. Um, yeah, and as Ellen said, good to stay on top of it. I was on a trail on Saturday. Don't worry, it wasn't a city trail. Um, and uh, yeah, I know. And some poor dog um, coming the opposite way got hit by a limb and seemed pretty injured and just kind of came out of nowhere. So good to be pruning and looking out for the hazard. So um, any questions for Haskell about this addendum? Do you okay. think, do you think, has it been like a particularly, I don't know, increased year of hazard trees this year or? No, we're, pretty well on the same trajectory, the same no, number. No. There just have been in more interesting places behind houses, uh, and yeah. so I've had to bolster. Uh, with the storm damage we had, it put our yeah. crews several weeks behind as well. Yeah, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, uh, I will move to approve a, a increase in the contract with Bluestone Tree for the remainder of the year. Okay, in a second, okay, in a roll call vote. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. Okay, that motion is carried. And then finally, um, another addendum with different tree service, J.R. Ellington for hazard tree removal. Again, similar to the other one, staff recommends approval of the contract addendum with J.R. Ellington Tree Expert Company to address aden additional identified hazards, amount 9,500, uh, not to exceed a total contract amount of 27.5. Um, again, this is so I can kind of competitively bid hazard tree removals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
there's no questions, yeah. I'll move to approve a, the addendum for, with J.R. Ellington for the similar hazard tree removal. Second. Okay, in a roll call vote. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. Okay, motion carried. Thank you, Haskell. And then finally in our section C, um, this is a review of the 2024 price schedule draft um, from division directors. This is not a vote. This is just uh, for us to review the, the updates. Good Thank afternoon. You, Becky. Becky Higgins, Recreation Services Division Director. Um, I'm gonna kick it off with things from the Recreation Division, and I'm gonna try to group some things together so that it makes it easier. Um, but if you have any questions, please stop me in route. So starting with the, um, on the page of Administrative Services, and I'm gonna give you the title of the area instead of the page because electronically the page number is different than <laughs> hard copy, so this just makes it a little easier. Um, so the increase there is an increase with the saline program at Lake Monroe, and that's an increase from $7 to $633, and the increase is to $7 and $700, so they're just upping it a little bit. Um, the cost of sailing classes on that. And then if we go to the Banneker Center, really what's happening there is we're increasing rentals by $5 um, per category. So it's just a slight increase to cover um, rising costs of staffing. And then we cleaned up some of the, the schedule so that it shows the different categories, A, B, and C and goes over um, those kinds of things. So I'm, you'll hear and see that throughout this. We removed um, from category A, that's really city departments and when they use facilities, and that used to say MCCSC on there and we no longer have a partnership with them so that was just removed, just cleaning up the price schedule again. So then under community events, the first thing that comes up is market. And in the April market category, what you're going to see across the board is a $2 increase in farm vendor spaces per day. So those increases that you see um, from $22 to $24 is the main one, but then at the different categories, whether it's a large space, small space, um, senior or youth, it's all a $2 increase from 2023 for the April market. And also in April there are, we changed it because the overall look of it because um, it goes from five days to four days. There's only four Saturdays in April in 2024. So that changes things a little bit as well. And then under the November market, you'll see that a lot of the spaces were removed because it will be an all indoors market at Switchyard Park. Um, it's our November market is moving to Switchyard this November in a few weeks. And so that will again be a flat, um, a flat fee of $22 a day. No, I'm sorry, yes, 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 so. And then that is for I'm sorry, let me back up. I messed that up. It's changed from three days to four days, first off, because there are four Saturdays in November in 2024. And then we've added the in the line indoor space with a fee of $96 for the whole month or $22 a day. Non-reserved non spaces are $24 a day. And then with our main market from May to October, there are 26 Saturdays during that period. And again, you, what you are seeing is the total cost if you multiplied $24 a day times 26. So you're seeing the total cost instead of the daily cost on that. But it reflects a $2 increase across the board. And then our weekday market, there is no increase 
um, in cost, but it is based on 17 days, so that's how that number was figured out. Under miscellaneous, there are two items. One is the prepared food vendors, and um, they have gone now from 6.5% of gross proceeds to 5% gross proceeds, which helps us meet our five-year goal that we had started five years ago, so we're happy to announce that. And we are adding a merchandise sales fee range of 10 to $50 for totes, t-shirts, and things like that. Also under community events is garden stage rentals and program classes. There is no change in the garden costs for this year, um, but stage rentals, which includes Waldron Hill Budskirk, is an increase of $10 per category. A fair of the arts is an increase of $5 for booth spaces from $55 to $60 per affair. And then um, the one change with gardens is just a change in date of when the discount rate takes effect. So it's just cleaning up dates for 2024. Mobile stage rentals, the only increase is the staff cost of supervision of the mobile stage. So you'll see a, just a little bit bigger range to cover the cost of increase in staffing. Um, we've also removed on that where there's a line at the bottom that said groups are responsible for transporting and setting, setting up of the little riser stage. That no longer is an option. It pretty much stays and now lives at the pavilion at Switchyard. So it falls under that one. Which brings us to Switchyard, which is probably looks the most different to you. And that's because it didn't have the different categories underneath it. So we've cleaned that up so that it looks the same as the others. And um, basically, we have added um, category B and C for the pavilion for weekdays, Monday through Thursday, 8 to 5, is $65 per hour. That's, that stayed the same. Um, but it has started to change a little bit in the lawn rental. So the pavilion lawn, directly right outside of the pavilion, it is being increased um, from $100 to $150. And the same thing with the pipe and drape that we rent and the stage. Um, so we're just starting to tag some individual items and some more amenities that we have now purchased to go along with rentals, like pipe and drape is new for us um, to be able to offer to people who rent it. We have also added the pavilion, the electronic video um, signage as a potential for renters who might want to bring in their own advertisement or their information and they can rent that electronic instead of putting up signage and use that during their event. So that's been added for a fee of $150. And then also fencing around the main stage um, that has become, it's, it's getting more popular and it's labor intensive. So we are reflecting the increase to cover the cost of that. So it is an increase now at a cost of $240. Um, yeah, and then going to youth programs, facility rentals, programs, classes, and events. You will see a $5 increase to Kid City to the different camps that they offer, Kid City Original, Quest, the CIT program. Um, so that's just, it's, it, it gets increased every other year. This is the year to increase that. And then um, lastly, under health and wellness, which is under miscellaneous items, we are increasing the range of rentals from five to, it was a range of $5 to $60, and now it's a range from five to $100 just to allow some flexibility. So those are, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions as you guys review this if you have any. Okay, all right, thank you. Any Who's questions next? for Becky? Yeah. I, I guess I have a question for Becky. Yep. Um, 
and I don't I don't want to step in a controversy, but I am. And that my question is not meant to uh, show my opinion one way or the other, but we know the issue with the food vendor, food trucks, and push carts issue on percentage of gross proceeds. I just have a couple of questions for that, and you probably answered these, but I. Uh, I don't live with this every day like the vendors do or like you do, so I apologize for my ignorance, but tell me what the the rationale is between a percentage of gross proceeds versus a fixed cost, which all other uh, individuals in the farmer's market pay. Is your, well, we charge a flat fee for the food vendors for the farm vendors, and we charge a percentage of gross income for the um, food and beverage artisans. We used to charge a flat fee for them as well, in addition to the um, 10%. But basically, the philosophy of our parks department has been, if we have people that are selling items in our parks on our property for during our programs, that we collect a percentage of their um, gross revenue. And so that percentage usually is at 10%. That's what it's been set. But we have been playing around with, you know, does it need to be 10%? Can it be lower? We have worked with the food and beverage artisans to lower that. Um, on a five-year plan, it started at 10%. It was at 6.5% this year. And we decided after conversations, especially with Eric in February, that, you know, hey, let's look at it. Let's see if we can go ahead and lower it to 5%. Um, this year to, to reach that goal that we had of a five year. And then we're, what we will be doing is having a master plan on Farmer's Market that will be for the 50th anniversary next year. And during that time, we will do review focus groups and see, is this the best way to be handling that? We don't know anymore. You know, it could be very different. We, we want to do focus groups and gather all kinds of information. So we'll be contracting that service out to a... Um, professional master planner. Okay, and I don't want to beat this to death because I think we're going to hear some of it in public comments. So, but, um, so you said we have other vendors that sell things that we charge a percentage. What are other examples of that? So if you have, if a vendor wants to come into a park and offer, maybe bring in a food truck at a program, it's at our discretion as to whether we're bringing that in to help the program itself, or if that's an added feature that they want to they want to come and they want to set up and and make sales like we used to get them for movies. We would get the ice cream trucks or different ones that wanted to come set up, and it was not really part of our programming. But if we could make that agreement with them, then we would bring them in. Now, food truck Friday is different because that's a rental, so that's a flat fee for everything because it's a rental. <coughs> from the organizers of Food Truck Friday. That's not our event. It just happens at our park. Okay. So for the other farm vendors, though, we don't charge a percentage of the gross receipts. Okay. And two more questions, and then I'll be quiet about this. Um, first question, if, if we were going to charge, and I've seen the proposal, I can't tell you what it was, but I know what some of the vendors are asking for. If we were going to charge a flat fee instead of a percentage, how would you think that might look? What would be a flat, how would you charge a flat fee? Is that something you've thought about? Is it possible? Have you thought through that process? Something that will be considered during the master plan process in 2024. We're not ruling anything out. We're not taking anything off the table. Right now, we're moving forward with what our goal was for this five-year period until we get to the master plan next year. And actually, that whole process came out of a discussion with the food and beverage artisans on, you know, on doing things better. And we said, hey, we do need to take a look at this. So how much... And how much did we raise from the food vendors last year, approximately? Do you know? Leslie's got that for you. Okay. Um, in 2022, we brought in $11,965 in revenue that was shared through 10 vendors. Um, and so far this year in 2023, we've brought $8,519 in. That's shared through 12 vendors. Keep in mind that's only really through September because we are still collecting 
really just through August, we're still collecting September and October fees. I will just say on your comment about a flat fee, although we haven't discussed what that is, I can tell you that a flat fee will be higher than the percentage that some of our vendors are paying now. The smaller vendors right. who don't sell as regular or as much would be paying more, paying a flat fee than they would be at a percentage. Yeah, I understand that. And I guess that's my part of my question. What kind of flat fee to raise the same amount we've raised from a percentage? What kind of flat fee has, and I don't know that you know that now, but it might be something I would want you to look at by the next meeting is what flat fee would it take to equal the same amount that we've raised this these past couple of years through gross? And we've been looking at that and trying to crunch numbers, and it's just, it's kind of a moving target still, and we're holding off until next year for that. Okay, and then my last question, how do we, how do we uh, determine what gross proceeds are? Is that an honor system between us and the vendors? Okay. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you so much. Okay. Wait, um, yeah, Ellen I might has have a... one more question for you too. And again, um, it's kind of to the same point. I guess I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit about the cost recovery model and maybe how the fees play into that. Where are we with cost recovery this year or in 2022? Leslie's got that, those exact figures on her, but our cost recovery, as you guys know, you dropped it to 50%. It was at 100% with market. It was a self-sustaining program, and you know, as we've moved into the market that we have now and moving forward, which is all we can do, um, we dropped that to 50, you guys dropped it to 50% until we met this goal to see if we could then actually sustain and we've been working on getting there now. Leslie has the exact numbers. Can you remind us when we dropped it to 50%? Um, I believe 2022 was the first year at 50%. It may have been 2021, to be honest. I can't remember. I can't remember if it was coming out of 2020 or coming out of 2021 after COVID, I believe, is when it hit 2021. Could you also maybe just explain a little bit, like for those who maybe don't know, exactly what we're talking about when we talk about with cost recovery and what our philosophy is on that? Yeah, really put me on the spot. Um, first of all, I'm Leslie Brinson, Community Events Manager. Um, yes, so cost recovery models um, determine how much expenses we need to cover based on our revenue. So if your cost recovery is 100%, you need to bring in enough revenue to cover all 100% of your expenses, which is what the market was originally. At 50%, it means that we need to cover 50% of our expenses based on the revenue we have coming in. At 100%, the food and beverage fee obviously played a huge part in that cost recovery. It was of a, a large number. We also had lots more farm vend or lots more food and beverage vendors than we currently have, obviously. As we continue to drop that percentage, it plays a much less role. Um, back in 2020, food and beverage were paying um, and I, I, sorry, I don't have the number. Eric might know it off the top of his head. They were paying maybe 60% of the revenue and farm vendors were maybe paying 30 or something. It was, a, it was much different. Right now, farm vendors do cover more of the revenue than food and beverage artisans. So we have flip-flopped that reverse or reverse that number. And so at 5%, um, they would be bringing in nine to $10,000 of a 50 to $60,000 revenue generating business. So it is a much smaller percentage and much more proportion of what we are looking for. So th the, the goal is to make it more equitable for everybody, um, and that's what we've been trying to do. We are on target to make 50% cost recovery in 2023, and we did make it in 2022. Okay, and then, and I guess, again, just for folks who don't know, if um, a program it, it reaches more people, we look at a lower cost recovery uh, versus a program that serves an individual, we look at a higher cost recovery. So it's a pricey pyramid. Uh, so if you think of the top of the pyramid as being something that's very in individualized, 
um, a golf lesson, something along those um, things, then the cost recovery is much higher. As you get down to the bottom base, which would be a lot more free programming, concerts, movies, programs that we offer that don't have a charge, those obviously aren't bringing in revenue, their cost recovery is much less, and then it moves through. The market is a bit of a weird one because it is offered free to the public, but it has a revenue source through farm vendors selling of totes and t-shirts, food and beverage, as well as information alley, so it does have a revenue source, which plays into that cost recovery, which makes it a little different than some other free programming in parks. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay. All right, thank you. Any other questions for Becky and Leslie? Okay, thanks, thank guys. you. All right, next up, Kido. Good afternoon, uh, Satoshi Kido from Sports Division. The Sports Division would like to add and increase the following fees. First, would like to add special use outdoor court fees, applying for tennis, pickleball, and basketball outdoor courts. Standard is $20 per court per hour. For non-profit organization, would be $15 per hour per court and the partners for $10 per hour per court. Just a note for this, uh, this is not a daily reservation fees. These fees are applying for only organized tournaments and events. Second, we would like to increase Twin Lakes Recreation Center membership fees. The last time we increased the fee was in 2014, almost 10 years ago. Past several months, sports division staff studied and gathered information about the competitors and the similar gym size in Bloomington. Membership fees including YMCA, Iron Pit, Gym, and Indiana Fitness Club. The data indicated the average monthly cost for the state of Indiana is $50.03. The proposal is to increase average five to ten dollars per month per person, but still lower than state average. The focus is to keep the fees affordable for the Bloomington community members. Lastly, we would like to increase personal training charge fees due to increase of the hourly pay rate for the instructors. Originally, the range was $130 to $895. We're going to stay the same time on low end, but high end, we want to uh, increase to $1,200. Do you have any questions? Just to clarify on the tennis, basketball, pickleball, reservations th those are just those are just groups if i want to if i just want to go over with my friend and play there that's not i'm not this is just a group reservation Correct. right that's, okay the group wants to have events and tournaments a certain time in a tournament mm -hmm. okay all right thank you um i was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you benchmarked the twin lakes recreation center membership membership was uh we didn't touch for long time, so that was low end. So we have decided we have to increase some fees to cover the operations and business. And we benchmarked some of the uh, local gym and uh, fitness clubs and the average cost for per month in the state of Indiana. And uh, we came up uh, $45. That's still lower than $50 per month. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very reasonable. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Keto about this section? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Street interim director, I can speak to the operations changes, um, which are are pretty minimal. Uh, cemeteries, we have no changes this year. Uh, shelter rentals, we have no changes this year. Those were both uh, adjusted recently, and we don't feel they require further adjustment at this time. Uh, and natural resources, just some Griffey Lake-related items, some incremental increases um, to launch permits, um, 
$10, $5, $1 increase based on annual, second annual, or daily permits. And under boat rental, uh, canoe and boat rental, a $1 increase per hour from $8 to $9, or a corresponding $10 increase uh, for the 10 pass. Okay, all right. Any questions for Tim about this section? Okay, so as I said, we are not voting on the price schedule. It is just a draft there in C8 today. And then in our Section D of reports, then we will move into Clarence Boone, who has our Farmers Market Advisory Council annual report. Good afternoon. Uh, this presentation, I want to say on the front end, reflects the opinion of the Farmers Market Advisory Council only and does not necessarily represent the view of the city of Bloomington. The council is composed of residents who serve as volunteers to inform and advise their fellow residents, city staff, and elected officials. This statement is for informational purposes, or this presentation rather, is for informational purposes only. Now, specifically, the Farmers Market Advisory Council consists of 11 members representing market vendors, customers, and food and beverage artisans. The council acts in an advisory capacity to the Board of Park Commissioners and Park staff on policy matters relating to the farmer's market. I'd like to introduce uh, the presenter for this uh, afternoon, Cortland Carrington. Uh, he is the owner proprietor of American Mushroom and Spice Company. He began serving as the chair of the advisory council in March of 2020. He is now in his third term. He is currently involved with the council's planning for the 50th anniversary of the Bloomington Community Farmers Market. And at this time, I'd like to respectfully introduce uh, Cortland. All right, do we have a, a quick overview? Thank you very much. Again, my name is Cortland Carrington. I'm the chairperson of the advisory committee uh, for the farmers market. <clears throat> I started my business right here as a result of the farmer's market in Bloomington, and we've grown our business. Uh, we now produ produce mushroom products and materials. We ship all over the state of Indiana. We ship all over the lower Midwest, and we distribute product as far as Connecticut and Utah, and it's all because of this farmer's market. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, as you can see, big overview of the numbers. Uh, 2021 uh, into 2022, we have about a 30% increase in the number of uh, customers attending the farmer's market. And then between 2021 and 2023, we're looking to be about 40% roughly. I think we're going to finish the year somewhere around 70,000 customers uh, coming into this market. Um, so that's really a a pretty big a pretty big jump now of course covid had a, a big impact on the market the year of 2019 as you recall was a great uh, tumult in the market over racial issues and so that knocked a lot of the market attendance down and it's recovered um, i've been through that whole process uh, over all those years uh, right here uh, now that our covid is is back i've seen a lot of faces return to the market that i did not see prior to 2019, 2018, they disappeared. A lot of persons uh, that are in the marginalized communities were afraid to come here. And, and I've seen a lot of those faces start to come back. So we're on a good, uh, good trage trajectory there. Um, also, you know, the farmer's market has changed. The, the, there are several markets in Bloomington now. So there's people have alternatives that didn't exist prior to 20. 2018 was the Bloomington City Market's high, high water mark. And so we're in a different landscape now. Uh, so we are making strides. As you can see, again, we got the 50th anniversary coming up. I hope everyone comes out. A lot of planning going into that right now. Um, nothing is finalized yet, uh, but we are gonna have a design, a logo design contest. Um, We'll announce that a little bit more as we move on. Uh, we're looking to produce some commemorative publications with photos from, from the beginning to the present time. We're hoping to pr produce a timeline board that can be hung up in the um, entry area that shows the history of the farmer's market. Um, 
We're also looking to add a couple of different kinds of calendars uh, for the sale booth, um, like uh, farm dogs, barn cats, farmers, vendors, pictures on a calendar that shows um, how the food is produced, food and beverage artisans, kind of behind the scenes stuff. So a lot of customers are interested in that. And uh, we're talking about having a return of farm tours and the farm tour dinner. I don't know if anybody here has ever been to one of those. And that COVID kind of destroyed that. And there's a, a lot of interest in bringing that back. And we're hoping to do that this year. And of course, we want to continue with the Harvest for the World celebration that uh, Clarence started. Um, it's a, a great thing, and we want to maybe expand on that some. Um, the farmer's market, you know, you, you talked about the pyramid. You know, the farmer's market is an extremely important community resource. It facilitates several million dollars worth of commerce exchange each year. Um, a lot of the farmers develop relationships at the market that spill outside the market. Our business is, is the same. We distribute to restaurants and grocery stores because of contacts that were made right at the market. Um, restauranteurs and other people come in um, to see what's going on here in Bloomington. It's such a big market, it draws people from far outside the local area. Uh, I like, kind of like to think of the farmer's market as a little bit of a food innovation space because there's a lot of interesting new ideas that uh, people bring to market here. Of course, the uh, farmer's market allows the local uh, community to know who their farmer is. This was really made uh, apparent during the COVID pandemic when people um, started thinking differently about how food gets to their table. And a lot of, a number of people have spoken to me over the years, you know, they appreciate the fact that the food is local and maybe only one person's touched it since it gets to their plate. Um, that's not so when you go to Kroger or the restaurant. So there's a lot of value that the community sees there. It's also a very important place for information dissemination in the info alley. A lot of people get information there uh, fun fact, we learned a couple of weeks ago that a rumor at the farmer's market can outrun Clarence. He'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, also, another thing that's uh, very important about the farm market is the fact that we have the farm to family program and almost all the produce vendors donate at, at wholesale cost surplus food that goes to several local food kitchens. And so that wouldn't happen if it, um, most communities don't have anything like that. So we are blessed to have that, and that's a very important mission to feed hungry people. Um, food, and vendor, uh, food, food and beverage artisan and vendor fees, um, that's a really a hot button issue, and we've talked about it extensively over, over several years. Um, going back to 2019, we made the recommendation to begin reducing those vendor fees. Now understand that in 2018, 2017, that the plan that came out in 2019 was the result of what was going on in the years prior. So with the summer of 2019 and the COVID panic uh, has changed a lot of these um, thoughts to some degree. But anyway, we are gonna end up down at the 5% uh, for the food and vendor uh, artisans this year and that whole thing was to try to better align some of the costs. And at the time, it was 100% cost share. And, and so the food, and ve uh, ben uh, excuse me, the food and beverage artisans played a huge part in getting us to that 100% point. Um, now that we've dropped to a 50%, it's, it's a, a whole different ball game. And, and I'm really grateful that you're going to be doing that. Um, having the contractor come in and, and give us a, a better plan so that we can look at it a little closer. Um, one thing I want to do, uh, remind people, is that those fee structures, to some regard, there's two different kinds of risks between the two different types of general vendors. A farmer vendor, some of our farmer vendors earn in an entire season what some of the food and beverage artisans generate in a month. So that's something that I encourage you to keep in mind as you uh, decide on the fee structure. So it is a lot of revenue difference between the two. A farmer, a vendor, you know, he has to plan months or years down the road. Um, 
for what they're going to have at market during particular parts of the season um, throughout the year, such as peaches and apples and things like that. Um, if you have a rainy Saturday, you know, it affects everybody equally. Um, but a food and uh, beverage artisan can always go out and obtain new ingredients, whereas a farmer is kind of stuck with the environment that develops over the course of months and years. And so the fee structure kind of reflected some of that different risk, so to speak, that's, that the different vendors see um, as they bring their product to market. Um, I'm not necessarily here today to recommend any particular exact course of action regarding the fees for 2024. Um, I just wanted to convey that from the perspective of farmers and customers and FBAs, that we ask that fees be set with an eye on uh, reducing barriers to entry of the market with new vendors. They see that fee and that's kind of a big number and it kind of shocks them. Um, thinking if we could reduce the fees some, it would bring more people, you know, more persons in to try their, you know, recipe at the market. And the more people you have, the, the revenue goes up. But that'll be something to be looked at with the master plan. Um, so there's a lot of variables, but the big thing we wanted to convey is that the fee structure needs to be fair and equitable and that the two different types of risk are kind of priced into that model, um, however that would look. Um, and that's really all I have um, that I wanted to speak of, and you're going to hear from some other people about that today, and that's great. Um, so just in conclusion, you know, we're knocking on the door of the 50th anniversary. We're seeing increased people coming back to the market in general. We are making our 50% goal um, this year. We might even exceed it a little bit. Um, the farmer's market scene in Bloomington has changed. It's not the same as it was in 2018, 2019. It's a whole different ball game. The farmer's market, nevertheless, is a vital source resource for the community, and it facilitates millions of dollars in, in general commerce, both in and outside the market each year. And uh, <clears throat> we hope that, well, we in the FAC and the city will continue to look at the pricing model um, between the food and beverage artisans and the farmers. Do you guys have any questions? Any questions for Cortland? Yes, thank you for your report. Sure. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I, I'm sorry, oh, I actually Jim had a, a question. question. Sure. I, I was, um, I very much appreciate your presentation. I guess um, I was trying to determine from what you said, what the position is, either your position and state, whichever it is, your position or the and the, the group that you're representing, what their position is on the current fee schedule. I, underst I understand the issues that you raise, but I'm not sure exactly what your position may be. It's, I hate to say it's wishy-washy. <laughs> um, my position is I'd like the fees to be reduced to the lowest possible point so that the city can meet its cost recovery goals. That's ultimately where it needs to be. There's a lot of passion between farmers and food vendors um, on who should pay what or, you know, or how that should work. The only thing I can say is, you know, like I said earlier, you know, a farm, like the farm vendors, there was a terrible peach year this year. So a lot of the farm vendors that spent a year or two years developing that product had nothing available to bring, yet they still had to pay the fee to be there when then they didn't have a product that risk doesn't really exist in the same sense for a food and beverage artisan because they always have fresh ingredients available um, as they need. So it's, it's a different risk. And so somehow the risk has to be kind of baked into that fee schedule. And, and I don't really have the answer for that just yet, except my position is the fee should be as low as possible provided that the city is meeting its cost recovery goals for the operation of the market. Does that help explain? Yeah, some. So you mean, and you're not just talking about food artisans. You're talking about all vendors. You, would, I mean, if if we could reduce the fixed fees for the farmers, that would be helpful. Or take into consideration something like. So you're 
you're not necessarily commenting directly on the food artisan vendors um, or the farmers. You just you just would like it to be as low as possible. Is that well, that you can still meet the recovery program? Yeah. Um, of, of all the vendors I've spoken to, none of the farm vendors are you know they're all very comfortable at the current fee structure at the price point. There's no real pushback on that. And most vendors that I talk to, you know, they love to be here. This is a great place to vend. The facility is phenomenal. The staff is highly supportive. And so the farmers, you know, they understand they're getting a great deal for the, the day rental space that they pay. So there's no, there's no pushback on trying to reduce that in any way. It's, it's more of how do we better align the food and beverage artisan and, and, and figure out the different risk. How, how do we do that? Or do we do that? I'm not sure if that. And there's no, and is the 5% the recommendation from your group or is that from this, is that from the department? That comes from, from your group. That comes from the city. From the city. Okay. Does your group have a position on that? Um, the farmer, the farmers like that revenue model. They would like to see it reduced. Um, it's, it's, it's a, it's a real hot button issue. And, and, and you, you have, you know, 15 people and you have 20 different opinions on that. Um, so. Okay. I'll let you off the hot seat. Sure. All right. Thank you very much, Court. Thank you. Good information. Actually, I have some questions. Okay. Yeah. We... Oh, sorry. My only concern is we have like nine minutes until Public Works kicks us out, um, and I know, yeah. yeah, and I know that we, and I do want to get your questions, but this will be back on the agenda for next time, and I um, also want to get to D. Tuttle's aquatics report, but I hate to have members of the public sit through the whole meeting and not be able to speak, so um, if no one objects, I'd like to just go ahead to whatever public comment we can squeeze in here at the end. So is that okay, D? Yeah, postpone okay. the aquatics report and your questions. Is that okay? All right, so then we will. Do you will... need a motion for that? Okay. Do you want to move to? It's just a agenda. Oh, yeah. Kim's, it's, Kim noted it is just a staff just, report. Okay, okay. So we shouldn't need it. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, D. So we can go to public comment. Okay. Those pesky public works people, they will not wait. So. Um, so, okay, so then we will move into Section E public comment, and if you would like to comment, um, we allow two minutes, I ask you to come up please and sign in and tell us who you are, and, and so anyone who would like to comment, come to the podium please. Yeah, go right ahead. There should be a sign in there, is there maybe? Yes. Or? Okay. Uh, will somebody cut me off at two minutes? Yeah. Oh. Okay, thanks. Uh, Kyle Smith is my name. Wilder Love Farm is the name of our farm. We're in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, we are produce farmer, uh, so veggies is primarily what we do. Um, started in 2018 and have been in vending at the market since 2018, um, every year. Um, just wanted to share my opinion on the fee structure. Um, I know for us, if we were assigned a percentage-based fee, that would be pretty impactful for us in a negative way. Like, I'm talking about our farm. If we got 5% of sales, that would be a very significant cost for us to pay. Um, so I kind of feel for a food artisan vendor in that way. Um, I also will say customers are coming up to me asking, where are the food-based vendors? So. I was here at every market this, this year, um, however many that is, 22, 25 at this point, I'm not sure. So I'm hearing that directly from customers, where are the food? I don't have a great answer for them other than I wish there was more food. People are looking to 
come to the market not only to purchase food, but to eat food and gather together. It's a very communal event. Um, I think crowds attract crowds, and so I think having more food artisans would be beneficial for the market in general. Um, I think lowering the fees to a, uh, to a flat fee is what I would like to see, um, especially if the revenue makes sense, if you can still meet your cost share or whatever. To me, that's kind of a no-brainer. Customers are telling me they want more food-based vendors. Um, I would like it. I think it would draw and attract more people. Um, I'll also say I'm very thankful for the market. Um, we love being there. I've been here in Bloomington since I was a kid. I now have kids. Um, so very thankful for everyone who has worked on that. So Great. thanks. Thank you, Kyle. Hi, my name is Oops. My name is Libby Gwynn. And I've been a customer of the farmer's market for 40 plus years since long ago when they were in a different location. And um, it's, it's, I'm here to support, to express my support for the food and beverage artisans, FBAs. Um, most of my favorite artisans are now selling at Woolery because the Woolery has a flat fee. And um, I find that very unfortunate. Uh, if I really want to go, I have to go to both markets because I like coming downtown. There's more mar farmers. But Woolery has, has most of the uh, food and beverage artisans now. Um, and also, if I want to get salmon, for instance, I have to go there because there's nowhere else to get that fresh Atlantic, I mean, Arctic, sorry, Alaskan <laughs> salmon. Um, and I think they all moved because, it was e it's because it's cheaper to be, for them to sell at the Woolery. They can afford to do that. And... Um, I would just think you should consider strongly going to a flat fee for everybody. It doesn't really make sense. I heard Jim ask what was the logic, and the answer did not was not clear to me that that was the case. And, and the talking about um, the, the loss for a farmer who comes to a market, and if it rains, then they end up with a lot of stuff. I actually am on the board of Farm to Family Fund, and I volunteer for them. And we have helped resolve that problem. The farmers now can sell stuff they have left over, especially if it's a bad <clears throat> you know, weather day. And uh, we pay them at 50% of what they would have. So it's worked out really well um, all around. And I think that that piece of the equation is almost irrelevant now. Um, and I do remember one Sunday, was one weekend where Muddy Forks couldn't sell everything because it was raining. So they are then stuck also with a bunch of stuff. So I think that point uh, didn't make sense to me. Right. Sorry. Thank you, Libby. I had more to yeah. say, but yeah. thank you. <laughs> Sorry, we're only going to be able to get in a, squeeze in a few more yeah. comments. So we want to. Yeah. Hi, my name is Mike Record, and I'm a Bloomington farmer. I own New Ground Farm. Uh, this is our 10th uh, year of farming here in Bl the Bloomington area. Uh, we've vended at the city market uh, with the exception of a couple of years, I think since 2016. And I just wanted to express the, a farmer's perspective um, uh, and, and say that I support an equitable fee structure. I recognize fully that the market is successful because of both kinds of vendors that we have there. And I think... Um, to, for the market to have any chance of continuing its growth, we need to add additional food and beverage artisan vendors. And I think the most equitable way to cover the cost of the market would be to basically have all vendor types share that. So I, I would advocate for a flat fee. Um, I would also, also suggest that you consider the 50th anniversary, a great opportunity to move to that equitable model and not wait. Um, I, the other point I'd like to make is I don't feel like a consultant and uh, uh, a study is necessary to resolve some of these issues. I feel like we know what market best practices are for farmers market. It's unusual to have this dual fee structure. And um, I think we have expertise right here that can help us answer some of these questions. So I would urge you to move to a flat fee for purposes of equi equitability 
and, I don't know if that's the right word, but, and also accelerate the time frame. I don't see any reason to wait, and I think the 50th anniversary would be a great opportunity to take the step of making the, the market equitable across all vendor types. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Hi. Yeah. Hi, my name is Joel Jacobson. I'm a food business owner. I own Simple Raw Eats. I make raw foods, which is basically brownies, lemon bars, pumpkin pies. Um, it's only been about three months since I started vending at the market downtown here, um, and it's really a new experience for me. For me. The last year I've been doing it at the winter market uh, and then at the Woolery. I've been alternating with the Woolery so I can pick up some here at the downtown. And I've been seeing how the structure is, learning about it and realizing, you know, if I right now as a new business owner offering new things, uh, I don't make enough to where um, I have the fee hurting me too much. But if I were to create, uh, uh, sell more, I would find myself having to give more of my revenue out to uh, the city when that stuff, that money that covers uh, basically selling my product, selling the stuff that I have sourced from different um, um, distributors help me to create a product to sell. And me being able to cover my costs is important for me. I see that the same thing applies to other food artisans who, yes, they would be paying a lot of money if they would make a lot of money at the market, but that, that money, as far as I can see for myself, goes to cover a lot of the um, costs. And so what I see for myself is that if I were to um, make more in the market I would, and grow my audience, I, have, I would eventually want to migrate to the Woolery or to the winter market due to that growing fees. And so that's my take. That's why, for me, it's more reasonable if I would just be able to pay a flat rate all, all around. And that's what I think is more um, equitable or more uh, equal bunch uh, around and across everyone. And that's, okay. that's my take. All right. Thank you, Joel. I'm afraid um, we are going to have to wrap up the meeting because we can't cut into the public works time that they have advertised that that is the amount of time that they will be meeting. We can certainly take emails and statements from anyone else um, to, I mean, some people have already emailed us. You can also send them to Kim, I believe, to get them entered into the record. Um, and we will be, this will be back on our agenda in November. Um, so we will have opportunity to discuss it there again. So um, Tim, is there anything that you wanna tell us before we? No, and, and I apologize, I <clears throat> hate cutting off public comment, but we are out of time, um, and we will certainly take that uh, into advisement. Our next meeting, November 14th at 4 p.m. here. Okay. All right, Th hold on one second. Oh, Thank, Thank you, and with that, um, I will adjourn the October yes, meeting of the, oh, one sorry. Question, Tim, so uh, hold next on one November, second. we are going to vote for the... Next month. Yes, at the next meeting, the, the, the fee schedule will be Yeah, there. on the price schedule. So during this time, we can request information and... Okay. Yes. Sorry. Okay, no, that's okay. So I'll adjourn the October meeting of the Bloomington Board of Park Commissioners. Sorry. I just can't multitask. Okay.